Good morning, and as you can see from the program, just like our practice looks after all parts of the body, we do try and talk a little bit about this and that. And dual mobility hips may be known to some of you, uh, especially working in the public hospital, and those who haven't yet heard of them will soon. A dual mobility hip refers to the fact that we have a ball within a ball. So there are two gliding surfaces. And I will explain the details thereof. So the inside ball can move and then the outside ball can move. What's the advantage? You'll see in a moment. Now total hip replacement has been with us for a very long time since John Charnley introduced this in England. Uh, it is one of the best operations as it reduces pain and restores function. And it's very cost effective when looking at uh, hip replacements in terms of quality adjusted life years or disability adjusted life years. Total hip replacement is in fact much more cost effective than total knee replacements. And last year we did approximately 50,000 of them just here in Australia. And as you're probably aware from many of the patients, you see that it's an excellent short and uh, a long-term outcome for these patients. Now, what's changed over those uh, many years of hip replacement is what some people call tribology, which is actually the materials which we use. They have definitely changed, as well as a convergence of designs so over the years, we've worked out certain non-cemented and certain cemented hip replacements which do well. On the whole, we now do non-cemented cups. But in the femoral stems, we still use some uh, cemented ones. Uh, they are almost all exit look lookalikes. And they have uh, uh, done very well, especially in elderly patients where the bone quality is not as good. Whilst in the younger patients, we use uh, rough uh, titanium and HA-coated prostheses, and the bone uh, is fooled into thinking that the HA is part of bone, so we get very good on and in growth. On the femoral head side, or on the articulating surfaces, a lot of things have changed. We used to have metal, uh, then we went to ceramic, then we went to ceramic type metals such as zirconium, and now I'm going to talk to you about dual mobility. We need to be aware that there are some failures in total hip replacement, some loosen, there are some fractures, there's infection, and there is dislocation. If we look at loosening, loosening used to be called aseptic loosening, which means that the bone and prosthesis interface has come loose and we see gaps. Patients, of course, feel pain. This may be due to a failure of ingrowth, maybe too much activity at first, or in fact, in some cases, occult infection, which we have not been able to prove. There are some indolent little bugs, such as staph epidermidis, which will not make a patient sick, but will cause loosening of a prosthesis. Fracture of the bone, especially in these elderly patients, is common. We count that as a failure of the prosthesis, or of the procedure, I should say. We sometimes get fracture of the pelvis. Fracture of a prosthesis itself is, in fact, exceedingly rare. The materials are well worked out, and if I see such a uh, picture, I almost always suspect that there was a manufacturing fault. Infection is one of the big problems and perhaps the biggest problem in joint replacement at present, and we try and attack this in many ways by giving patients preoperative showers with Pfizer Hicks, whilst giving perioperative antibiotics, usually for 24 hours, we also use intraoperative irrigation now often with betadine. And we also use antibiotic impregnate cement in those where we do use cement. There are, of course, patient factors which are difficult to control, such as obesity and diabetes. And we 
calculate that in most cases infection can be calculated as about 1 in 200. Now I'm talking about deep infections, not just a superficial wound infection. Now dislocation is the actual bit which matters where dual mobility comes in because dislocation is a bother for patients and for surgeons. It is dependent to some extent on the cup position. It can be uh, dependent on the version of the femoral stem or the soft tissue tension and is much more common with small femoral heads. That is why on the whole, for those of you who have paid attention, uh, in, on x-rays we see larger femoral heads than we used to see them and talking there in direct millimetres, John Charnley started off with 22 millimetres. Uh, his Continental colleagues went to 32 millimeters. We are now almost always going to 36. But with a dual mobility, we can actually go to 40 or 45 millimeters, which is a much more stable construct. So having shown you the picture of the head within a head, the jump distance is the distance the head needs to uh, come out of the prosthesis is a much bigger jump distance and also these people have a bigger range of motion and that is something which perhaps you will see especially in elderly patients. Now talking of patients we do need to select them a little bit so we use dual mobility now in those patients who have a um, fracture and require total hip replacement. We are also conscious of those patients and they're increasing in number who've had a spinal fusion. Now imagine if you have a spinal fusion, you're actually going to, when you bend forwards, flex more at the hip because you can't flex in the lumbar spine, so you're at slightly greater risk of a dislocation. We also use them in people with neurological conditions, Parkinson's, uh, strokes, and uh, similar conditions. In revision surgery, where there is interference with the soft tissues, again, dual mobility helps, and perhaps we should be using them in all elderly patients. There's nothing which we do which doesn't have a downside. We believe that using polyethylene in young patients may be setting them up for failure of the polyethylene in the future. In France, uh, which is the country where most of the dual mobilities are done at present. The age range has moved from 70 down to 60, and in fact, they are using more and more also in the younger patients. There are occasionally reports of dissociation where the small head comes out of the big head, and there's a slight increase in the cost. Now, I can't give a talk here without mentioning uh, one of the jewels in the crown of the Orthopedic Association, which is our National Joint Replacement Registry, which is 21 years old this year. We now have more than 800,000 hips, so we're dealing with big data. And a lot of what we can say now is, in fact, based on observations, what happens. And the registry looks at all revisions. That is, we count a failure if that joint had to be revised for whatever reason. We can give guide to surgeons and patients, and in fact, even you can look up all results in the Joint Replacement Registry because it has a public portal. And it also has a private surgeon portal where I get a feedback. Now, if we look at the uh, registry, uh, you will see lots of uh, graphs like this. And in general terms, because we're looking at revision rates, the higher uh, the uh, curve, the worse it is. And many of you will be surprised to see that in fact the anterior approach has a higher revision rate than either the lateral or posterior approach because it's being marketed in our community as being better than uh, the posterior. Now, if we look at dislocation, the anterior approach has a lower dislocation rate, as you can see at the bottom green line. And so then you can say, well, from that point of view, why don't we use more anterior? If we look at loosening 
again, it's actually higher in the anterior approach. So that, in fact, exactly balances the other. Now, if we look at dual mobility in particular, in this case, we're looking at age. There's actually no difference if we use dual mobility in younger or older patients in our registry. If we look at gender, although there looks to be a slight difference between these two curves, the um, confidence intervals overlap, so there's actually no statistical difference in whether using these in males or females. And these are all examples of what data our registry uh, can give us and, and how we can guide surgeons to, to the use. Now, dual mobility in our registry, now we have 21,000, and you'll be interested to hear that there's been a 22% increase of the use of dual mobility just in the last two years, and you will, I believe, see a greater use of them in the future. They have a lower dislocation rate compared to all other articulations and are mostly in our country used with non-cemented cups, but can actually be used with cemented cups as well. Now, in terms of you as physiotherapists, dual mobilities are more stable. We get other patients up and about as well, but we can now do this for the elderly with a bigger confidence in interval. Uh, we have uh, less uh, or minimal hip precautions because there's extra stability. Dual mobility uh, is now offered by many of the companies and the increased stability here is again shown when comparing the low, uh, the bottom line, which are the dual mobility versus the higher revision rates of all the others. Now the uh, bottom line is a bit shorter because dual mobility has not been available for as long as the other articulations have. So here you can see a lovely video of what actually happens in uh, the dual mobility as there's movement of the inner and uh, the outer cup. And I hope you found this short presentation interesting because I believe that dual mobility articulations are increasing and are definitely here to stay. Thank you very much.